really lucky to have uh, Annie Ashmore with us today. Uh, she comes from a very esteemed family. I thought I'd mention briefly also that uh, her, her, you've met Brad already, and her mother, Leslie, is actually the person who referred Nancy Unger to this group, who gave, I think, four or five talks here. And then Nancy Unger referred someone else who ended up referring Michelle Chapel, who's given five talks here, I think. And, and she gave one or two talks herself, Leslie did, and this is Annie's second talk. So she's a generator of maybe more talks than anyone in humanist history here. So <laughs> I'm going to give her a round of applause. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> So, and, and she, uh, Annie Ashmore's uh, mother, and Annie's wonderful, and uh, in um, the ninth grade, she, she saw a film, I gather, that got her very interested in a group called Invisible Children, and which was fighting against this uh, uh, terrible warlord in Africa named Joseph Kony. And so she's been very active in that all through high school, and I believe she started a chapter of that at UC Davis, where she's now a sophomore. And then uh, this summer, she actually went to Uganda for six weeks and happily came home safe and sound from that. So I'm really looking forward to her talk. Please give a warm welcome to Annie Ashmore. All right. Well, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, it was so wonderful speaking to you guys last year. You're one of the most um, you're like one of the best audiences I've ever talked to, so I really appreciate you being here today. So um, I want to talk about a couple of things today. Um, during today's talk. I want to talk about why it's important to volunteer, why it's important that we uh, put action into things that we really care about and are passionate about. Um, I just want to talk briefly a little bit about my story both here and in Uganda. Um, and I want to talk about the work that I've done uh, and will continue to do with my work in Uganda and outreach in the US. Um, I want to talk about what I learned from my trip this summer, um, both about, um, I learned a lot definitely about the cultural implications of being a first world person, um, volunteering in a third world country, um, and I also want to talk about um, what I learned uh, with regards to uh, the people there and the innovations that they're coming up with uh, to help alleviate poverty. Um, and I want to talk about some future plans, just some things that um, I will hopefully be working on in the coming months to uh, help further alleviate poverty in Uganda. And I want to talk about how all you guys can help. There are a million ways that um, people can volunteer and help and get out there in the world and get passionate about things that really matter. Uh, and at the end we'll have questions. So I have a short video to start us off with. Um, it's probably one of my favorite videos. It's called, Is Justice Worth It? And I'm going to start it off basically questioning why social justice is important. <laughs> I might not be working. It says QuickTime not available. It's okay. We can skip it if it's uh, if it's not working. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to do it. Oh, sure. No, it's all good. <laughs> all right. So I'll, I'll basically just summarize what the video says. And the video is saying that a lot of people view social justice as the most futile thing you can do with your life because you can. I mean, there are so many things in our world where, like, you can give your money to business and you see money coming back. You can go to the gym and your muscles will grow and you'll see results. But a lot of times with social justice, it seems like it's really hard to get ahead. There's not like a bank where you can store a surplus of justice and a lot of times it's really difficult because it feels like you'll you'll patch up one hole in a region and war will break out in another and you work and you work and it seems like there's never any profit or progress um, and that can be frustrating for people and sometimes it leads people to ask the question is it even worth it is justice worth it and um, I think what I've learned is um, although that question is understandable, it's a little bit ridiculous, right? Because um, I think that that question rarely comes from people who are who are actually tired of pursuing justice and instead are just tired of the idea of it. Um, and I think it rarely comes from people who have actually labored for years and have good reason to ask this question. And I think that people 
people, um, don't, people who have been working in these regions don't ask that question because you, you identify with these people. If you work in a community where people are suffering um, and you identify and commune with these people, they become friends and family. And once that happens, it's such a powerful thing that that question, like, it almost becomes offensive even. Like, what do you mean, is this worth my time? Because I'll never stop fighting for these people. Um, and that's what the video says. I'm actually quoting most of it. I've watched it a lot of times. But, um, but it's, this, it, it, it's a really beautiful message where if you work in a community and you identify with the people in it, um, you'll never stop fighting for them because they're just like family. So that brings us to our next um, kind of what I was just talking about. Why volunteer? So in this day and age, we are more globally connected than ever before in history. And that's really powerful, especially with social media and, uh, and the internet. I think it's pretty impossible to, um, to uh, kind of write off other parts of the world and say like, oh, well, like, that's, that's over there. Like, we're here and we're fine. Um, and there's this quote by Elie Wiesel that says, indifference reduces the other to an abstraction. Um, and I really like this quote because I think it's so easy um, like to be, if you're physically isolated from the problem, um, if there's suffering in the world, it's really, it's really easy to just like kind of um, to be indifferent about that and reduce this idea to an abstraction. One of the funniest things that happens to me a lot is people, people instead of saying like, oh, like, why do you want to go to Uganda? Why do you want to help people in the Kampala area? People will say, well, why do you want to go over there? Or like, why, like, why, why do you want to go overseas? And things like that, because that makes it, the idea somehow easier. It makes it kind of easier to like, make it this vague subject because it's, it's easier to kind of deal with uh, not helping someone if you don't know anything about them. So um, with that being said, we do live in a first world country. We have tons of resources to help people. We have the potential to make some serious change here, especially if people are motivated and passionate about causes they care about. Um, and because we live in a first world country and we're citizens of a global community, I think it's our responsibility to help people who are, uh, who are less fortunate than we are. Um, it is also, it's also a source of so much personal growth. Um, I've learned so much um, with my past five years of working pretty much full time with invisible children. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been bigger than my best dream for it. Um, and it's really something that um, I just encourage everyone to get involved with. All right, so I'm just going to talk really quickly. This is like basically the entire talk I did last year about my work in the United States. So um, since my freshman year of high school, I've worked um, extensively with invisible children. Uh, I've lobbied with US policymakers to work towards long lasting peace in northern Uganda. Uh, in the picture on the left, uh, it's a group of our invisible children club at UC Davis meeting with Sean Eldensburn, who's Senator Feinstein's right hand dude. Um, and we were uh, hoping to enact some policy policies that would allow troops to go to Uganda and just survey and sort of pinpoint Joseph Kony's location. And we fundraised thousands of dollars uh, to boost the economy there. And that's been really powerful to see northern Uganda rebuilding after it's been war torn. So this summer I had the incredible opportunity to actually go there and work on the ground and kind of understand the conflict more from uh, a personal standpoint. So uh, I volunteered in a school. I taught English and literacy um, to a school that was very understaffed um, because they didn't have the resources to grow. And so um, I was basically able to alleviate some of the stress that comes with not having enough resources. Uh, I learned a lot about Uganda's culture. Uganda has an incredible, beautiful, growing culture um, that's steeped in a lot of tradition. And it's really, really beautiful. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, I also met a lot of people who worked uh, in local Local social service projects, people who um, just on their own accord have started schools, orphanages, um, just to name a few, um, just individuals who are able to start these enterprising um, organizations that really help the community. And I made a ton of friends. <laughs> it's, everyone there is incredibly friendly. They're, uh, they're called the, the Uganda is called the Pearl of Africa because everyone there is so incredibly friendly and sweet. Um, it is uh, full of green. It, a lot, a lot of, another reason is because it is super, super green there. It's beautiful. Um, and um, it's just an incredible place. So just to talk a little bit about what I learned. Uh, like I said before, they have an incredible culture. Um, 
if you go there, people are very are very proud of their culture. The, um, they have traditional dress, they have traditional uh, traditional music, traditional everything, and it's so incredible to learn more about that and see what a beautiful, unique culture it is. Um, people there are incredibly resilient. These people have been through a lot. Um, they, they've been um, subjected to a lot of violence with Joseph Kony, although he's no longer in Uganda, but um, there's still lasting effects of his, um, of his war there. Um, and so a lot, so the people there are incredible. They've had to cope with so much and they've, um, they're really amazing. Um, also another, um, Another thing I learned about Uganda is that um, there are a lot of things against people succeeding there. Um, you can be the smartest person there, but if you don't have food or water, or if you're busy taking care of your family, or you don't have access to education or sanitation or health care, um, it's going to be a lot, lot harder to succeed. And so there's a lot of things going against people um, getting out of impoverished communities uh, and bolstering these communities. Uh, another part is I didn't really realize, like, you can read the statistics about death there. Um, they have one of the lowest um, life expectancies. Um, and I guess I didn't really realize that this was so uh, that this was so important when I went there uh, until I went there and I saw that there are no old people there. I saw like a few and they were it was like wow look at this like 60 year old like isn't that cool like wow that's pretty incredible but there's definitely something that I wouldn't have thought about like you can see this number that like the average life expectancy is a little over 50 and then you can actually go there and see that like so many there's so many young people there. Um, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about two things, which is that um, it's really important to be conscious as a Western, Western meaning like from the US or from basically a, a first world country. This is what Ugandans refer to, like they'll say, uh, oh, like Western volunteers, meaning people from the first world coming to volunteer. It can be really, really dangerous to these communities if we don't do it well and if we don't, if we're not cautious about our actions there. Um, and also the social service projects that individual Ugandans there are planning, they're growing and they're doing amazing things. So I want to talk briefly about the dangers of volunteering abroad. Basically the fact that because we are Western, we come from a first world country, we can really, really make a negative impact um, with our values unless we're, unless we're really careful about that. Because if you're not open minded about the place where you're volunteering at, if you're looking for differences or kind of like bringing those up, that can really hurt the cultural self esteem of the native country you're traveling to. Um, when I was in Uganda, the school that I was at, they had, um, they host international volunteers a lot. And I was really sad there's this sign that they had, and I don't remember what it was talking about but it was basically this sign that said um, like oh to all visitors um, this is the way they kind of like were explaining to visitors the way that they teach in order to in order so that the people who are coming from uh, people who are coming from abroad wouldn't critique them or criticize them and it's, I think it's really sad that these cultures feel like they have to explain themselves because they've been constantly criticized they feel like they have to look for approval from the West because um, because we're, we can be very critical. And it's really easy to look in on a situation where there's poverty and say like, well, why don't you just do this differently? I feel like that would probably help. And like that really hurts the cultural esteem of a, uh, of a country. You can say like, I mean like basically you're telling them like, oh, why don't you just be more like us? And that can really hurt um, the, be the cultural beauty of a place. In addition to that, um, there's this phenomenon called the white savior complex, which um, part of it is this idea that people uh, from first world countries will like go into a third world country without understanding uh, the language or culture or basically anything about it and they'll come with a solution that they've already determined. They say this is going to work, let's throw money at it, let's do it and it doesn't work because they don't understand the culture, they're not working with local people and it doesn't help. Um, this picture on the bottom is one of my favorite pictures ever. If you guys follow the blog Humans of New York, um, this guy's amazing and he basically just goes around the country or he goes around New York interviewing people and hearing their stories but he, uh, he got an opportunity to travel to many places including Uganda. I believe this one was taken in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo 
And it's basically this guy standing next to this picture um, of this little African child with like an empty plate. And the guy is interviewed, he says, we really don't like pictures of this because it, it depicts us as like these helpless people who like, we need you for the solutions and the help. Like we need, like, we need your help because we, we're, we're just like these helpless people. And so I think it's important to realize that like these people, it's not, it's not individuals' fault that there's poverty there. And in fact, first world countries are responsible for a lot of the problems that are there. And so it's not a character flaw or something like, there's like an intelligence thing or there's an easy solution to any of this. And these people are perfectly capable if we can, if we can help just give them a few resources to grow. I think that we'll see a lot of positive impacts from that. So the ideal, of course, we still do want people from the first world to come and volunteer there because it's the best way to raise money and awareness about a cause. But so the ideal for this situation is to have people who have been, who already know a little bit at least about the culture, who have been trained about this, so like people who are culturally sensitive, people who are open-minded, people who aren't going to try and make changes to a community that's already, that's, whose culture is fine. And another ideal is that, um, to use local ideas, to work with people on the ground there who have grown up in this conflict, who have grown up in poverty, and who already have ideas about how to make these communities better, um, and, so, and to implement their ideas with aid from the United States. So this is one of this is an awesome picture. I love this picture. It's from uh, it's kind of hard to see. I'll I'll explain it all. But it's from um, this movie called Inequality for All by Robert Reich, um, and it's about um, it's about the lack of upward mobility in America. But I also think that uh, a lot of what he says can be um, can be translated into other places. So basically, the idea is um, in this part he's explaining about what, how awesome it would be if we raised the minimum wage basically. So he's saying if you raise the minimum wage then the average workforce has more money and they'll buy more. So that allows companies to be able to grow and hire more and because of that more people have jobs, more people have money, tax revenues can increase and because of that the government can invest more in its people, specifically in education. So that means that workers are better educated and because of that the economy is going to expand because you're more globally competitive because of that productivity grows um, and then because of that companies can raise their wages. So it's this virtuous cycle um, and it's a really great ideal to look back. But if something goes wrong in this cycle, then, um, then it's not good. For example, if you lower the minimum wage too much, then workers can't buy as much, companies have to downsize, and it's this downward spiral. So what we've seen in a lot of developing nations uh, are problems with the government. So because the Ugandan government um, doesn't invest well enough in its people, there are lots of organizations and groups and international communities that are working to improve the government, but while this is happening, people are dying there, and there needs to be some sort of aid while the government is getting their act together in order to address this need. So if there's an inefficient government, we need to have an alternate solution for now while the government is while the government corruption is being dealt with basically by the international community, I think that there are ways that we can help these people um, while, um, while the government is basically sorting their stuff out. <laughs> So basically, this brings back um, this brings back uh, to what I was talking about about social service. I think that social uh, social service projects. I'm just going to talk a little bit about them, but they're local projects that are aimed to develop communities, and they're done by individuals um, in Uganda. They're developed by Ugandans. They're um, like I said before. There's schools, there's orphanages, there's counseling services, libraries, clinics, pretty much anything you can think of that's going to help the community. Um, They've, individuals have developed these and it's really beautiful to see um, and these have like endless benefits to the community um, it leads to uh, because people are more people can be more educated in the schools people are going to um, get treatment for diseases there's just so many benefits that aim to develop communities However, one problem is that because they're developed by individual people, they a lot of times lack the funds to grow. So they're able to operate and educate people and treat people and do all the things that they want to do, but they can't do it on a large scale. They lack the resources to grow. So if we can grow these local projects, then we can develop communities. Because these people, a lot of times, they want to help the entire community, but because they're on a very, very tight budget, they lack the ability to do this. They, um, 
So I think that um, after going there and talking to a lot of people, everyone there is saying these local, these local social pr service projects are doing a lot of good, they're done by really benevolent people, and they have the ability to improve the quality of life for a lot of people in these villages. So. Um, there's definitely a, there's a place for Western volunteers here because um, they're local ideas, they, they, are, um, they have the potential to be sustainable, but, um, and how do we, basically how do we help? How do we, how do we, these, this infrastructure is already there, but it needs to grow. Um, these schools need to serve more students, but they don't have desks. The, hosp the clinics need to grow, but they don't have enough medicine. So how do we, how do we help that? And this comes to um, what I hope will be something that I'm working on um, in the upcoming months, in the upcoming year. So hopefully, what we talk to, a lot of these people at these social service projects would say, you know, we would be totally sustainable and we wouldn't have to, um, we would be able to grow if we had a water well or if we had, if we had an agricultural project, if we were able to have something that generated, um, something on the side basically that generated some source of income, then we would be able to invest more in our projects and grow them. So, what we could do, uh, if there is a way, we could hire someone there who would hire, who would, um, whose job it is basically to evaluate the efficiency and potential of these projects, then we'd be able to get a good read on the ones where if we just invested a little bit of money, they would be able to grow so much. And this works really well because we'd basically be putting money into a sustainability project that's separate from their actual project and these sustainability projects would be able to fund the growth um, and independence and sustainability of these projects. Um, and we could even, I'm not sure what we're going to do about this, but um, we could even measure the success of these projects by coming back in later months and seeing how they're doing, seeing um, if it worked and what we can do to improve in the future. So our goal here is to maximize Western aid but minimize the influence we have on these communities. Like we talked about before, we don't want to be imposing solutions on these people that don't want our help, but we also want to provide as much aid as we can because we have the ability to do that. So that being said, we want our successes to be locally grown. We want these solutions to come from the people there. We want to come to communities and search for, search for solutions that are already in place that just need a little bit of money to grow. So, here's our plan, sorry this is a long one, but um, we're hoping what we can do is we can raise funds and awareness through international volunteers. This has been wildly successful in the past and it's an industry that's growing. Um, so basically we'd be able to minimize the Western influence by um, giving volunteers the resources necessary to uh, kind of understand uh, the communities that they're volunteering in um, and volunteers that we've worked with before are super enthusiastic. They're willing to basically pay us to volunteer, which is like, okay, yes please. <laughs> so that's, that's a pretty sweet deal. If people are willing to pay for, pay for food, lodging, airfare, transportation, so that they can volunteer at our projects and also donate to our projects while we're there, that's amazing. And the best part about it is when you put someone in a situation where they're right next to poverty, right in these projects where they see, where they see people who are directly affected affected by poverty. Um, it's kind of impossible to ignore that, right? You never stop fighting for your own. So these people, a lot of times, they'll go back home and they'll start fundraising in their own communities uh, and we'll be able to expand our projects. So um, pretty awesome model we've been thinking about. So that being said, I've been working with a team in Uganda and we started a nonprofit that's going to do exactly that. There's our logo. I made it. <laughs> but um, so, that, so we started a nonprofit. It's a um, it's a Uganda-based nonprofit. Um, pretty much um, our entire team is Ugandan, which is unlike pretty much any uh, international nonprofit. Um, everyone from our website designer to our cinematographer to like everyone we work with, uh, including the project leaders, is Ugandan. I'm one of the only people who isn't from Uganda who's working on this project and my job is to just educate people who are not in Uganda about the problems that are happening there. So that's been really incredible, just having everything done by a Ugandan team and um, having solutions that are put in place by these people. Um, and so basically my role in this is to teach people like you about some of the problems that are happening there uh, and to talk about what we can do to help and talk about 
um, basically um, what our role in this. And so, um, and finally, a lot of the projects, a lot of the um, organizations that are in place right now that connect international volunteers with projects in Uganda, a lot of them, unfortunately, the money does not go to the projects. They go to the higher ups in the companies. Um, the group that I went with this summer, I was really saddened to learn that on their website they said that they do donate to the projects, but when I talked to people there, they said they don't really get, they, they get barely enough money to run their projects. And that's really unfortunate because now the people who are working at these social projects are dependent on international volunteers and they can't become independent. So what our goal is to empower these communities through sustainability, through growth, and through eventual independence. We don't like, I think that um, if we have a rotating group of projects where we're basically putting in something that can give them, that can generate a source of income, then I think that is so much more powerful than the solution which right now a lot of um, groups are working with, which is that basically these social projects are dependent on international volunteers forever. So that brings us to our last slide, how you can help. Um, so first one, very obvious, like us on Facebook, um, because uh, if you're interested in our mission, if you share what we're thinking about, um, and if you want to get involved, that's the best place you can, uh, you can find us. Um, another thing, we've set up a table over here. Um, these paper beads have come uh, a long way. Um, they're um, made in the Acholi refugee quarters. Um, in the city center of Kampala, there's a village um, that is entirely refugees, and um, they're from northern Uganda, but because uh, they were displaced due to Joseph Kony's actions in northern Uganda, they've had to live here for years. Um, and basically, they, they had their educations and their lives interrupted, um, and there's no real way for them, there's no real way in the foreseeable future for them to be able to get out of this. Um, and so one thing that people are doing there is because a lot of the people there aren't educated, in order to fund their education, they make paper beads and sell them. And so we brought back some so that we're hoping to establish a vocational school in the Acholi quarters. We actually have had um, big successes. Um, we just started a vocational school in another village and um, we're about to fill it up with computers and sewing machines so that we can teach the people there how to um, how to have a so how to have a source of income. Um, another way you can do it is to just donate money. <laughs> we like that too. Um, and finally, if you're interested, um, you can give me your email or phone number, pretty much any information, and we'll contact you. Um, we would love to have you with us here in the United States, working with outreach, or totally come to Uganda with us and stay in our guest house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Well, that's the end of my presentation. But. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't, uh, I guess I'm going to have to walk the mic this morning, and uh, you can mark it? Okay. Oh, you want to run? Okay. All right, so remember, uh, raise your hand, and I will bring the mic to you. Please don't shout out, and hold the mic like this, close to your mouth, not far away. Like this. Okay, and I'll try to get people first, first raise your hand, uh, talk. So, okay, I've got three so far. Uh, hello, I'd Hi. like to know a little bit uh, more about their culture and their, their government, uh, th their language. Uh, is it an uh, oppressive government? Wh what is their religion? Um, what is their language? Did, did you have to learn uh, their language to communicate with, with them? Uh, things like that. Sure, those are all great questions. Thank you so much. So. Um, their government is technically democratic. They have pretty much every form of government. They have a king, they have a president, they have a parliament, so they kind of have it all. Um, and their president, unfortunately, does not have term limits, so um, President Museveni has been uh, the leader of Uganda for, I think, 40 years, I want to say, um, and that's a long time, and so a lot of corruption has set in, unfortunately, so money that should be put into investing in the people has um, been diverted, unfortunately. So, um, 
they also don't have the freedom to protest. So although people still do protest there, a lot of times protesters are arrested very quickly. Um, in terms of religion, a lot of people there, um, it's, a, it's a good split between Christian and Muslim. Religion is a really big part of their, um, a really big part of their culture because um, I think one reason is because it really brings communities together um, and it also gives them the ability if they, um, I think a lot of people find comfort in um, like uh, in attending religious ceremonies after someone's passed away or after something hard has happened. I think they find a lot of comfort in that. Um, let me think, other questions. Oh, language. They speak this language called Luganda. Um, it's basically like the word Uganda, but with an L at the beginning. Um, <laughs> they laugh a lot because they live, they, uh, the region that I was in is the Buganda region. A lot of the people in the Buganda uh, region are Muganda people, members of the Muganda tribe. Uh, they speak Luganda and they live in Uganda. So, <laughs> but um, so it's um, they speak Luganda. Um, it's, it sounds sort of like Swahili a little bit, um, but um, it's kind of a mix between Swahili uh, and another language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have a couple questions uh, since there's plenty of time. Um, one is, you know, you mentioned cultural differences, you know, and you didn't get very specific as if, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, but things that Westerners might find unusual. But, um, you know, they, they, they have the, the lowest life expectancy in the world and you have to assume that they must be doing something wrong, you know, or something's not right if that's the result. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if those cultural things are, 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 are those the things that are leading to the short life expectancy or not? And my other question is about technology. Um, mm -hmm. Do they, you know, how much internet access is there? How much cell phone, smartphone stuff? Because there are some people who feel like a, a big way to bring uh, third world countries into the first world is to get technology to them and that way they have access to the world's knowledge and that is, is, is um, technology increases and prices come down, um, you know, people in, in Africa are, are, are getting more and more access, you know, to the rest of the world where they can go out and f learn for themselves and figure out better ways to do things by just getting online. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I actually want to answer that first because I'm just so excited about it. So Uganda is, um, Uganda has, um, not everyone there has a computer, but everyone there has a cell phone. They have great cell service there. Um, I could call some, I could call pretty much anyone in Uganda right now with my phone. Um, and they also have, um, uh, pretty much full internet access. Most of my friends uh, I'm friends on Facebook with from there. We Skype, we talk, um, and it's really great to keep in touch with them that way. In addition to that, um, one thing that people are hoping to do is teach um, computer programming to people there because that's something that you can do pretty much anywhere in the world. So. Um, one thing that we're planning to do at our vocational school is teach people how to program. This has been successful in the past, uh, and if we can get enough computers donated, I really think we have the ability to teach a lot of people a really useful skill. So technology is really helping them. Um, they, um, they're definitely super, super advanced in the world of cell phones. Most people, they have smartphones. Um, so that's definitely, definitely really positive. Um, uh, in regards to your question about um, their uh, life expectancy, they are, they do have one of the, they, um, I'm, I'm not sure, I was looking at the numbers last night, they don't have the lowest life expectancy, but they're definitely down there, unfortunately. Um, and I think a lot of those stem from um, not cultural problems. Uh, they definitely, they had an Ebola crisis there, I believe in 2005, but it was handled pretty well because people, um, because there aren't like religious things that um, kind of impeded people from eradicating the problem. Um, so I don't, I don't, this, the problem is definitely not cultural. I think a lot of it just comes with the inability to access resources that people need to succeed. So um, a lot of times people are born into poverty. They uh, can't afford in education. Um, a lot of it just comes down to not having the resources to succeed. Um, they are trying to prioritize education. When I was there, uh, the capital, Kampala, has probably like 10 universities there and most of the people that I worked with um, have at least a bachelor's degree if not a master's, which was really cool. Um, and education is definitely a really powerful tool to increase the economy. Um, 
But if, there, if the barriers to getting an education, like lack of access to food, water, health care, if those are insurmountable, then it's really difficult for people to succeed. Uh, yes. Enjoy the nice work that you're doing, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, one of the interests that I have is how to allow people to lift themselves out of poverty, whether it's just a family, a small village, or what have you. We've mm -hmm. all heard the pros and cons of uh, water wells. Mm -hmm. We do it, it's wonderful, then it deteriorates and it breaks, and then it sits there, and then nobody can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So my interest would be, if you know of some techniques that actually have worked, whether it's something that aid a family with agriculture, maybe a craft, maybe a little manu home manufacturing facility, something that the local village could do, I don't hear much about those successes on the small individual. And I'm wondering if you have heard of these, and if not, do you know a source that I could go to to find those? Yeah, oh, Thank that's you. a great question. So um, definitely one thing that I've seen individual families doing is um, if they have room for it, they'll start a small uh, corn plantation or they'll start growing beans. Um, and a lot of times um, villages, when you walk through villages there, they're basically just lined with people um, selling you their agricultural products, and that's definitely a good source of income. Um, so if you have the land to do it, which people usually um, have enough land to do it, and their ground is extremely fertile, so it's, it's not hard to grow things there. There's also a really great group, if you want to check them out, it's called Heifer International, if you've heard of them. Uh, they're awesome, yeah. So what they do is they, um, they provide people in a village with a goat or a cow or basically some some livestock that basically enables them to have uh, a renewable source of income. Uh, and they've been really, really successful. I don't know the exact stats, but if you go, I'm sure it's probably heiferinternational.org. They're awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is that it works in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Because not only do they provide a pair of goats, a pair of rabbits or whatever, so you give it to a widowed woman so she can feed her family, mm -hmm. but she is required after one year to do the same thing to some other unfortunate woman that's there. So after mm -hmm. we're long and gone, these things in perpetuity will continue to do that. It's the seed that continues growing. Yeah. Thank oh, you. that's beautiful. I actually didn't know that about them. Wow. Thank you. Hi, dear. Hi. Uh, you were talking about the criticism and the critical when they were judging. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because it's like deja vu because three years ago I had a confrontation with the Department of Education that I was teaching my daughter homeschooling universal thinking, which is what you're doing, thinking outside the box, as opposed to in America they teach our kids critical thinking and that's why it's hard for us Americans to adapt to what you're saying right away, we should just be doing, because we've been you know, trained as a critical thinker in America. So we really need to work on changing to the, back to the universal thinking so that all of our children can be free to do what you're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a really great perspective. Thank you. Yeah, that was definitely... I was criticized. I was criticized you know. yeah. yeah, it's definitely something that... Um, I think we do need to work on, and I think that um, it was, I felt I felt badly that um, that people felt often like they had to explain themselves to me or explain their cultures to me as if it was something that I was going to criticize. Um, and um, I think that it's just because they've seen enough Westerners who say like, "Whoa, why do you do that?" or like, "Oh, that's weird," like just things like that. <laughs> yeah, and so I think that if we go into it with an open mind, I think um, I think that that has endless benefits. So thank you. Thank you. When they have an election, what kind of information is available, and how do they decide who to vote for? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think um, I believe they're working on. I'm actually not completely sure. I'll have to I'll have to look into that. But I believe that it's usually the incumbent versus a new person, um, and I'm pretty sure that um, I don't know how much I don't know how much I don't know how elections are covered there. I'll have to look that up. But I do know that the it's usually the incumbent versus another person. There's lots of slander um, recently. Um, uh, the uh, person who's running up against Museveni released a bunch of pigs into Parliament. Uh, so it's, it can a lot of times be very nasty. Um, but 
it seems like the incumbent usually wins. <laughs> So, uh, I, did I miss anybody that had their hand up? It looks like we've got someone there and there. Okay. Um, I'm just curious what your living circumstances were like there. Did you have running water? Did you have enough to eat? Were you <laughs> clean? I mean. <laughs> That's a good question, yeah. Um, I mean, it definitely depends on the project that you go with, but personally, where I was at, the food was amazing. Um, they, had, um, they had a cook there, and um, the, uh, so I would eat things like, for breakfast, I would eat like eggs or pancakes um, with a lot of fruit. Everything was super fresh. That was one thing that was incredible. There was no preservatives in, any, in anything, and so everything was really organic and locally grown that I ate. Um, and for the water, it was on and off for the water, literally. Um, <laughs> the water and electricity were intermittent. Um, but usually water was good, although um, when I was there, I think their shower was broken, so I just took bucket baths and it was fine. But it totally depends on where you're staying. Oh, OK. Hi, dear. I work for this uh, company in San Jose. They have. Uh, a gathering place like we have called Spur and they're working on the waterways and another way to solve the problem is I'm working on um, the waterways of Holland and Belgium but you're going to be working on the ones in Uganda because I'm always trying to get everybody to focus on the water like this lady just asked the question how'd you stay clean some people have to walk miles and miles and miles and miles with stuff on their heads to get their water. Mm -hmm. So I, I was promoting a campaign in Maui called Artisan Wells and I was trying to get all the rich people I know to do it and it was very hard. We'll talk about it later but that's what the focus was is to start getting wells and not just be on the grid pipeline thing. Mm -hmm. That's yeah that's a water really good point. from the rain. Yeah definitely. Oh that's actually yeah that's something that I hadn't thought about. Are with a little container. Yeah, and in Uganda it rains probably three days a week. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's definitely something that happens because Uganda does have a national um, water, water, basically they have pipes, but um, they're really infrequent. So the people in my village, we, um, I never had to do this, but um, the students at the school would walk probably two, three miles and bring back water in these cans. Some of them were as young as five. Um, and that's something that we actually helped um, in the school where I was at, build a water well. They're doing it right now, it's not done yet, but they're building a water well that has a solar powered pump so that it'll be wow. working for a really long time. Um, and so they're working on that and that'll be able to provide water to the community um, as well as increase their, uh, so the kids don't have to wake up really early in the morning to go do that. Uh, I, I just want to have another question about the low mortality, the high mortality rate, just mm -hmm. get a sense of it. You know, usually when, um, that happens, it's usually either high infant mortality, war, disease, uh, food and water. Um, can you give me a sense of what the, you know, most people die of there in yeah, kind of broke down by those? Yeah, so luckily Uganda's been totally peaceful since 2005, ever since the Lord's Resistance Army left there. Um, so they're completely peaceful, so no one dying from war, but um, the diseases that are there are pretty nasty. They're things that we probably wouldn't even be able to deal with here if they were here. Um, I know that HIV is a really big problem there. There are a lot of clinics working to lower the rates and that's really great. Um, in addition to that, there's also a lot of cancer. Um, a lot of people there use wood burning stoves to cook their food and inhaling all that smoke every day. A lot of people get cancer. The cancer rate's higher than the AIDS rate, I'm pretty sure. In addition to that, malaria and typhoid are really big problems. Um, malaria is... Um, it's pretty nasty. Um, not Most people don't die from it. Uh, the people there get it a few times a year, um, but people can die from it if it is serious um, from complications. Uh, typhoid is something that we get va we can get vaccinated for here. Like here, you just take a, you take a few pills and you don't get it for like eight years, but they don't have access to that medication there. Um, and so everyone there is prone to getting typhoid. And a lot of times that happens if you, um, 
if you drink water that you haven't boiled first, if you drink contaminated water, but you can also just, um, it's not contagious, but I think there are other ways you can get it too. A lot of people there get it like once a year and you get really sick from it. Oh, <clears throat> what led you to Uganda as the focus for your volunteerism? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess um, for a really long time I was involved with Invisible Children. Invisible Children has recently decided to move all of its outreach operations from the U.S. They're closing all that down so that they can focus solely on transferring their uh, transferring their resources to the people of Uganda. So everything that we've built there is going to be run by Ugandan people, which is incredible. I'm so happy that they're doing it, but it also means that I won't be um, as involved with it here. Um, but the reason I got involved is I saw a movie movie by them, it's called The Rough Cut, and it's basically these three guys, probably about my age, these three white guys who decide they're going to go to Africa and, um, and, and document what's happening there. They're all film students, and they went there, and their plane got diverted, and they ended up in northern Uganda. And it's this incredible story where they, they find out, this was when the Lord's Resistance Army was in northern Uganda, um, and the kids there, to avoid getting kidnapped by the army, they had to commute every night into bus parks and basically be guarded by um, these guards with um, automatic rifles. And it was just a very scary situation, and they documented that. And it was something where I'd never felt so passionate about a cause before. I don't know if I ever will be that passionate about a cause, because it was, it was something where these, it was like these five-year-old kids who were in danger of being kidnapped, no fault of their own, but it was leading to, it was leading to so much destruction of their community. Um, and I figured like if, if I have the ability to help, I'll do whatever I can to help these people. Yeah. I just, this is kind of a quick question, but you were talking mm -hmm. about wood stoves before and you were talking about the good food that you had where you were staying. What kind of a stove did they have there? Um, I believe I'm pretty sure they had a wood burning stove, um, although they, um, their stove was outdoors, so it wasn't as bad because some of them, some of them are either really near inside or they are inside, and so um, uh, just because it rains so much. So luckily they were able to afford a covering for their stove so that they can cook outside and not be as at risk, although it still is really bad that they have to, um, that they have to inhale the smoke every day. But, um, they were able to put it outside and buy a covering for it so that it wouldn't get damaged by the rain. But it is still wood burning. Hi, dear. Hi. Um, I was really concerned about the smoke when I was raising my kids. I raised them by a wood burning stove. And I discovered in the mountains, it's peach cedar I was using. It's a clean burning. So you don't have that heavy tar in your lungs and your baby's lungs. Mm -hmm. And the other question I wanted to ask was, um, what's the difference between an invisible child and a missing child? Because you said you work for the invisible children. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good question. Also, a really good point that you brought up about maybe using a different type of wood or a different type of material. Peach cedar, great. Yeah, just some, yeah, some sort of thing that will, uh, that will prevent uh, as many people from getting harmed by it. That's a really great idea. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that's a yeah. Um, uh, the difference between an invisible child and a missing child. So invisible children, um, they talk about. Um, it's kind of an umbrella term for the kids there because they're invisible because the government doesn't keep track of them in the in their census because they're kidnapped. It's invisible because for a very long time. Um, the international community did not pay attention to them. They didn't uh, take action to help stop this. So I think it was just invisible because people were indifferent to their suffering who weren't directly affected by it. Um, and so luckily Invisible Children has worked so much to raise awareness about the problems that are happening there um, to make them less invisible. Okay, is there anybody that had their hand up that I didn't see? Oh, does anybody else have a question? Oh, Byron's going. one. I, I was just wondering, uh, do they know where Joseph Coney is now, and mm -hmm. or what are the efforts to try to apprehend him? 
Oh, that's a really good question. So, um, Invisible Children is focusing a lot on rehabilitating communities that have been affected by the Lord's Resistance Army. So they're doing a similar thing that we are. They're sponsoring vocational schools, sponsoring kids getting an education, things like that. But they've also we've also worked a lot before sending troops there to try and pinpoint his location. Um, Obama has a $5 million bounty on Joseph Kearney's head, um, so that's definitely one thing that's worked. And so he's basically right now, he's hiding in the Central African Republic, um, and he's taking advantage of the mass chaos that's happening from religious wars there. Um, and so he's, he and his army are kind of hiding in that, um, and um, whenever they need food, they go and terrorize a village and take all their food. Um, and so they're kind of they're living in there. But luckily, um, there there are um, a lot of local governments there that are pursuing him. Um, and the U.S. Army is um, there to try and pinpoint where he is. But they've gotten very close to catching him. They've uh, at certain points they've pinpointed his location to like a hut in the middle of like this big forest. But they weren't able to get there in time. So definitely a lot of efforts being taken. Um, and they have, um, there's a website called the LRA Crisis Tracker, which basically gives the ability for people in these communities to report when an attack has happened. Um, and so you, they, you can look at where the attacks have happened, what type of attack has happened in order to pinpoint where he is. Hold on, who wait for the mic, huh? That doesn't get on. Uh, I don't like to talk that loud with people around. Um, how did you choose to go to Uganda instead of ISIS? Because we're going to need people in ISIS too. Oh, so so why did I choose Uganda instead of somewhere else? Uh, I guess like, sure, yeah. I mean, I guess this is a cause that I've been involved with for a while, um, and. Um, I think Uganda was a place that really needed international attention, especially while the Lord's Resistance Army was still there. Um, but I think that I do want to focus my efforts on a concrete place because I don't, I, uh, I don't want to, um, I don't want to dilute my efforts by working in a bunch of places at once. Uh, I think that I have the potential to really help a lot of people here instead of just sort of helping a lot of people. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that's why it's just a place that I've. Um, it's a place that I've been involved with with Invisible Children, and it's a place that's really, um, I'm, I'm just friends with a lot of people there, um, and I really um, identify, and, uh, identify with them. Hello. Um, have you ever heard of In Stove? No, I don't think so. Okay, they make uh, these large stoves. Uh, they, um, they transfer the heat twice, so one brick of wood could uh, boil like a, I don't know, 10, 20 gallons of water or something. Wow. Uh, they're in the Portland area. They're like 30 miles south of Portland, called INSTOV, Instove. Great. And I'll write that down. they are already in Africa. And they have, I think in Nigeria, they actually started a manufacturing plant for these uh, stoves. They're very clean. Um, They've actually come here twice to give a uh, demonstration, mm. so uh, I would advise getting in touch with them. Wow, yeah, I would really love to. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about what kind of energy resources they have because I've heard you talk about wood burning things, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. Do they have natural gas available that could be um, utilized if it were developed? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and what kind of electricity is available? You know, give me a kind of a sense of, you know, who has it, how long it's on, and that sort of thing, you know. Sure, yeah. Cause, cause, because wood doesn't seem like a very sophisticated form of energy, you know, you know. You could cut down all the trees and then you have a deforestation problem. You know, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so that's a really good question. So the, definitely there's a really big push to use solar energy. Um, a lot of uh, places, a lot of communities have been transformed by this. Um, there's a group called, I think it's called Solar City, um, that's in San Mateo, and um, they work to provide solar panels here. But in addition to that, they also have a nonprofit that works to provide schools and other social projects with solar panels in, um, in different parts of Africa. Um, and that's definitely something that's really helped transform communities 
communities is using solar power. Um, they do have electricity, um, but it's provided by the government and it's very intermittent, so sometimes you can lose power for up to like maybe even three days. Um, and so it's something where like when the power goes back on, everyone goes and runs to charge their phones because like you don't know if you're gonna get it for a long time. But uh, so um, there is electricity. Um, it you'll probably yeah, I mean you'll probably have it, but it does go out kind of randomly. Um, as for natural gas, um, I don't know how common it is, but um, that's definitely something I'll, I'll have to look that one up about natural gas. I know it's not accessible to a lot of people there. Hey. I had a question if no one else has a question. Uh, <clears throat> I, um, I'm curious, as I'm <clears throat> abysmally lacking in knowledge in um, the country of Uganda, so how many, like are they have three or four large cities, the, what's the biggest one, and relatively speaking, what was yours relative to them? Sure, so I actually was fortunate enough to live in the capital. The capital is Kampala, it's gigantic, but unlike the capitals here, the very, very middle of it is really, really developed. It's like San Francisco, it's super developed, um, people work there, it's a commuter city. But on the outskirts of Kampala, it's, it can be rural, there are villages there that um, people aren't doing well in. I mean, there's a refugee camp in the capital, so the capital is the largest and most prosperous city, but not by any means is it um, doing well in all of the city. In the very middle it's doing well, but on the outskirts, um, that's where you start to see a lot of poverty and slums. Hi, girlfriend. Uh, you said you were going to be speaking Swahili? Oh, it's uh, Luganda. Yeah, and you, but that you said something about Swahili, right? Oh yeah, it's um, Luganda is sort of a mix between Swahili's language and um, I forget the other language, but it's a mix between Swahili and something else. So it's it's similar but not the same. So you could come home someday and teach our children if you come back to the states. Oh, I'm not an expert at Luganda. I don't know very much at all. <laughs> I know. Okay, I just want to tell you one more thing. On the Big Island, we use something called a Paloma. They're like three hundred dollars, and they're as small as a little portable vacuum. And we used to go to the cold water showers at the beach that were open to the public and you just thread them on like you would a hose mm -hmm. and you have instant hot water. Wow. And they were, they're $300, but the government kind of got rid of the Paloma. While we were there, they were trying to destroy the concept and we were trying to keep it alive. But that's another way we could send Palomas to your country and we thread them to cold water and it's instant hot water. Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. It's like a little burn, yeah. Yeah, when you were answering the one question you, you missed, what language do you speak? English, mostly? Oh, yeah, everyone there speaks Luganda and English, so they teach English to all the kids in the schools. So um, pretty much everyone I talked to spoke English. Um, I felt really badly because I have a very strong, like, Californian accent. <laughs> so um, I know sometimes I had to speak really slowly um, because um, definitely I'm probably probably even people here have a hard time understanding me so um, that's that's um, that's just um, they um, yeah so I spoke English yeah I have a question uh, the community that you're specifically working with how would you characterize how people sustain themselves in other words do they are they actually producing products that they can barter and trade or export or is it just sustaining themselves how does that work that's a good question, yeah. So there are definitely a lot of ways that people choose to do that. A lot of times people will sell food, they'll grow food themselves and then sell it. Um, but there are definitely things like um, probably, uh, I know a lot of villages have tailors in them, so there are a lot of people who have good vocational skills. There are carpenters, there are seamstresses, tailors, there are people who make paper beads. So there are a lot of different skills that people have and a lot of skills that we have the potential to teach people there in order to sustain themselves. Okay, more questions? Anybody? Ah, I've got one here. Uh, two more. Okay. I wanted to ask, uh, are, are people free to criticize the government? Or is it, it's, it's nominally a, a democracy, but I thought Uganda is pretty undemocratic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, they definitely, um, 
are lacking in their freedom to protest. I'm not sure what the exact law is, but I know that um, they would always televise protests, but they would get shut down very quickly. Um, I, um, I think that um, you can criticize. You can criticize there, and there's definitely criticism in like journalism. But um, I'm not sure the exact laws. I definitely, I don't, I don't believe that they're as free to criticize their government as we are. Yes. Uh, uh, what is the general uh, sense of uh, what uh, of uh, gay people? Yeah, that's a really that's something that um, that was something that was pretty shocking when I was there. Is that um, I think that um, one thing that I hadn't thought about is they definitely do have a really negative stance on gay people, which is really unfortunate. That was something that um, that um, when people ask me about it, I would always say like, well, I think that love is love. I do think that um, gay people should have all the rights that we do, but I probably don't want to talk about it any further because I know that we have differing opinions on that. Um, and um, it was something that I was talking to someone about who is very open with me, and they said um, a lot of times the government will pass will try to pass a really shocking law, uh, like something something terrible that everyone gets outraged about. And while people are really outraged about that and protesting, they'll go and they'll go ahead with their own agenda and secretly pass a bunch of other things. So that's it's definitely something that um, the government has used as a tactic to kind of do their own thing while people are distracted by this bigger human rights issue. I was just wondering, while we're on the subject of the government, what is what is the presence of the government there? Can you pretty much ignore it? I mean, are, um, are there police on every corner? Or? Uh, yeah, there's definitely a larger um, police presence in everyday life than there is here. Um, some really big stores, uh, when you walk into them, there will be a metal detector and a police officer with like a big gun. Um, so that was definitely something I, I wasn't prepared for. Um, and I mean, as far as I know, they were all pretty, they were pretty friendly towards me. But I do know that some of the other volunteers while they were there, um, they have a law where basically on government properties, when you're walking in um, a specific district where a lot of the governmental buildings are, you're not supposed to walk on the grass. And so um, the, some of the other volunteers walked on the grass and they got in trouble. They didn't get arrested or anything or sent to jail or anything like that, but they definitely were like very harshly warned about that. Um, and um, so there is a police presence there. Um, and um, yeah, if that answered your question, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what crime is like there. Do mm -hmm. you have uh, a lot of violence? Do you have theft? You know, what's the people's attitude toward, you know, the things that we sort of take for granted here, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I definitely think that um, being in a first world country, we are so privileged that we're not that we're not oppressed or forced into poverty to the point that we are desperate for money or resources. And so I think that um, we're privileged that we've never been put in that point, or from, I'm assuming the majority of us here haven't been pushed to that point. But that being said, um, you don't walk around at night very much unless you really well know, unless you know the area really well. Uh, I didn't go in here without a guide just because I'm not very street smart. <laughs> and. Um, it's important to like lock your doors at nights, and a lot of the windows do have bars on them. But there are a lot of precautions that you can take to really minimize the risk. Um, but um, yeah, I'd say uh, like as a white person, it wouldn't be super safe for me to go walking around alone at night. I wouldn't do that. But um, yeah. Uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned about other volunteers. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether they are mainly from uh, Western. Con oh, sorry. I was wondering whether they are mainly from Western countries, or have you come across volunteers from other places in the world as well? Oh, volunteers from other places in the world. That's a good question. Um, I do know that there are a lot of volunteers who come from, uh, like Australia. Um, 
so a lot of people from Australia and other first world countries, I guess Western is like the general term that they use um, when they're thinking about uh, first world volunteers. But yeah, technically Australia isn't Western or there are other, there are other countries. I, I believe there are some people there from like Italy and um, other parts of the world. A lot of the British people go to Uganda too. It's an ex-British colony, so uh, they drink tea all the time and uh, they spell words Britishly. <laughs> Hi, I w wondered if you saw a Chinese presence, because I've read that the Chinese are doing a lot of development and investment in Africa. That's a good question. Um, I probably saw like one Chinese person there, like during my entire stay. Um, I don't think that there's a huge Chinese presence there. I definitely did see the. Uh, I definitely did see a larger Indian presence. Um, a lot of the TV shows, like the soap operas and stuff, those were all Indian made. Um, I believe um, one or two of their major phone companies is Indian based. Um, some of their foods that we would look at and assume that they're Indian um, are um, like Ugandans have adopted them. Uh, so I'd say there's probably a larger Indian presence. I didn't really see a lot of Chinese people there. Hi, dear. I just want to give you a homework assignment before you go to Uganda. Hetch Hetchy is the water resource of Palo Alto. Yeah. So I want you to research that for me, will you? Sure. Happy yeah. Christmas, dear. Wonderful journey to you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I definitely need to read more about the water reservations here. Water reserves. Oh, that's yeah. Oh, yeah, I visited it before. Yeah, sweet, thank you. Okay, uh, why don't we give a round of applause to our speaker again? Thank you. Remember, um,